lezzet. Okay, that was very Sorry, I'm going to redo this. Audi online audience, really sorry. We just had forgotten to unmute ourselves. Things happen. Even after two years of using Zoom, you make these mistakes. So, uh, welcome to Chai and Y. Uh, very briefly, Chai and Y happens first Sunday of the month at Prithvi, third Sunday of the month at Ruparel Theatre in Mumbai, fifth Sunday month from a lab in TIFR. The next one, October 16th, is on the 2023 Breakthrough Prize in Fundamental uh, Science, which has gone to four researchers in quantum information sciences. Uh, we'll hear a talk on that. And um, out here today, it's a pleasure to introduce Dr. Malay Patra uh, from the Department of Chemical Sciences in uh, TIFR, where his group works on developing new molecules, which are hopefully more effective and have less side effects in cancer chemotherapy. Uh, that's what he will talk about, us, uh, tell us about today. And uh, just as an introduction, Malay came from Medinapur College to uh, IIT Bombay, master's there, PhD in Germany, Ruhr University, Bochum. From there, uh, postdoc at MIT, another postdoc at University of Zurich, and then back to TIFR. We are very glad to have him and his young lab that he's setting up uh, at uh, TIFR. Over to you, Malay. Uh, what we'll do is we'll just start the uh, screen share. Yeah, um, so let me just start. Uh, I think uh, everyone can so hear on, me on, on uh, here. Uh, can you guys hear me? On, uh, on, okay, perfect. On, yeah. um, and I hope you folks here can listen to uh, him. Yeah. Yes, I think okay, uh, yeah, as long as you guys can hear me. If you don't hear, just scream. Uh, okay. Just and then I will shout. Control. Um, hide. Very good. This guy also will put out of the way. And I think you're set. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I think uh, first I have to thank uh, Arnav, who is a very good friend and a colleague uh, in TIFR. And uh, I know him since my interview day. I can remember uh, he was sitting on the audience and he was asking a little bit, you know, off medicinal chemistry questions, which were li a little bit related to physics. And that is how uh, I know his face from uh, that day. And then afterwards, when I joined TIFR in 2018, uh, September, uh, I get to know him, uh, him better and better. So uh, thank you very much uh, for this nice opportunity uh, so that I can share some of my knowledge that I know or learn uh, about cancer and one of the you know very uh, um, widely used treatment options, which is chemotherapy. You all actually heard of, I think, um, this time. Uh, so basically what I will do is um, I try to keep it very simple, not too much technical. Okay. And uh, so the uh, the flow will be, I decided to talk about a little bit about cancer, just to give you um, kind of a glimpse of uh, how, you know, cancer starts. And what are the factors um, that leads to uh, the later stage of the disease? And then we talk about what are the therapies which are commonly used and very briefly. And then I will talk about what are the new therapies which are about to come to the clinic or made it to the clinic in the last few years. And then we extensively talk about two chemotherapeutic drugs which are often used for treatment of many different types of cancers. And I will talk about how this drug works, how they kill the cells, and how they also do a lot of nasty side effects to the patients. And we learn a little bit about the chemistry, about the mechanism of action of the drug, as well as the mechanism of toxicity. And then I will tell you at the end, what are the strategies that is used in the clinic, or can be used even in a better way, to uh, balance this risk versus the benefit of these drugs. And that is why this is called a, a double-edged sword, because you want to hurt something, you can actually get uh, hurt by yourself. And then, uh, if time permits, I will tell you very briefly what we are trying to do um, in our lab and uh, what we have achieved um, in this last four years. Um, I will be very brief in that, in that part, um, and, but I will tell you that, um, and I will show you that it's possible uh, to come up with something even better, uh, what we have right now. Um, so let's start. Okay. And if you have any problem in understanding, just maybe stop me and then ask me a question. Okay. okay so um, look, if I have to uh, define cancer, you all uh, heard uh, the, the term. 
um, you can, in a very crude sense, uh, you can say that it's uh, rapid growth, um, uncontrolled growth of some sort of a mad cell in our in our body. So what does that mean? Is that when you have a cut, for example, and your cells proliferate, they divide from one cell to two, two to four, and this is how you get the cut repaired. And once the cut is repaired, then it stops. So that means there is a switch which switch it on the proliferation and then when the need is you know fulfilled it gets switched off okay but this switch off thing does not happen for cancer once a cell starts to divide it divides into two four eight it's an exponential growth and then at the end what you get a mass of undesired cells in one of your organ where it starts and then that will give inflammation to the organ produce a lot of metabolites, unnecessary, which is a lot of fluid you can think of, and that interferes with the normal function of the organ. Each of our uh, um, organs has a specific function. This is how our body works. It's very systematic. If something wrong happens with that organ because of some undesired mass, then that organ fails. And then on top of that, what happens is from that uh, mass, a few cells can migrate to another organ. And then you enter to the later stage of the disease, which is called metastasis. And I will tell you how this actually happens. And it kills obviously many people. The numbers uh, currently are kind of 10 million people are dying every year worldwide, if you look at. Um, now, another thing is that before I move ahead, uh, that there is um, something that when I was a kid, um, I uh, often you know, hear from people that if somebody has a cancer, that's kind of a death. You have no chance to survive. But that is not really true anymore. Because now um, there are many people um, who actually survived in the last, let's say, uh, 10, 15 years. Um, many people survived. And most of the cancers nowadays can actually be treated. And some of them can actually be cured completely. That's not a, not a problem at all. So we are doing much better and better. And we have not lost the one. That is what I want to say. Now, to tell you how this starts, okay, I have to just point out. And uh, so what happens first is one of your cells somewhere in the organ, either because of stress or in the lifestyle or for some reason, for some accident, you get some sort of mutation in your gene, okay, in one of the DNA. Because of that, some proteins will be synthesized, which are not required for the cells to function. Because DNA directs what proteins to be synthesized through RNA. Okay, and I will tell you a little bit uh, when I move forward how this process works. But ultimately, the defect happens in the gene level. Okay, then what happens is these cells go crazy and then they start to divide into two and then four. And then, as I told you, you get a mass, undesired mass, and that is termed as primary tumor. So, this is where you start to have it. Okay, and this is what happens. This is in the organ level. So, you see this this white spots okay although they are you know uh, white uh, here it's presented white just so you can visualize but to be honest you will not be able to see a difference between cancer and normal cells they look very much similar okay and so here just to show you that this is how it looks like when you have cancer in the kidney one of the side okay so these small masses will be there and they will grow bigger and bigger then what happens is now you might have wondered that for the cells to divide or proliferate, what you need? You need food, you need oxygen, right? That's normal. This is how we all grow. And how that happens? Because when you have one cell divided into two and then you have a mass, then just imagine the blood vessels which are away from the core of the tumor, okay? That blood vessel will not be able to supply any food or oxygen to the core of the tumor. So what it does is very clever. You can think of it's another organism which is slowly growing inside your body. Okay, it secretes a factor called angiogenesis factor, and that factor stimulates the next blood vessel which is sitting and force that blood vessel to grow towards the direction of the tuber. And then at the end, what happens is the blood vessel grow, and then you have the blood vessel wrapped around the tumor. Then they have access again to the food oxygen and everything and then again even they grow bigger and bigger okay and this process is called angiogenesis and why this is very important is because you can see if this does not happen after one or two millimeter size of the tumor it cannot grow further okay then what happens 
they get the food they you know grow bigger and bigger now as i told you in the later stage of the disease what happens is some of the cells migrate from one organ to another organ okay how does it happen that also happens due to this blood vessel formation towards the tumor so a few cells of this is a primary tumor just imagine this is a breast cancer okay it's a cartoon and a few cells from here will enter the blood circulation and before even they enter what they do a clever thing is called they will send a message through a hormone that is called metastatic factor and that will go to many organs and it will find a suitable organ and make the site prepared for the cell which is coming okay so you can see everything is very planned okay and then a few cells enter to the systemic circulation obviously most of them will die okay because in blood they cannot survive they cannot even grow until they stick to something so in blood if they are circulating they will eventually die they cannot grow at all okay what happens then a few cells will enter the blood and then one of them or two of them will end up in the desired organ where the site was prepared for further growth and then they will stick to the organ at that site and then start to generate again another tumor and that is secondary tumor so you have the let's say the primary tumor in kidney the secondary tumor could be in the lung okay and this is how it start to spread everywhere ultimately okay and obviously it's not um with the same rate for every cancer it varies from patient to patient varies from cancer to cancer varies where you got the tumor there are many factors involved in this okay um now we will look at what are the uh, traditional ways of of treating cancer obviously the first one came into the clinic was surgical removal of the tumorous tissue okay so surgery is still one of the very you know uh, well known um, way of treating cancer uh, but this is only successful where you have a chance to locate the tumor in the very early stage and it's only localized in one of the place and that tissue can be surgically removed because you cannot do surgery everywhere just for example think about having a surgery uh, inside your spinal cord okay and then there is always a chance the moment you are trying to remove the tumor completely you will cut a few of the nerve and then the patient will not be able to work for the his, his whole life and that is what i have seen who happened with one of my relative a uh, few years back that is what i know and uh, so that means the ideal way of doing those things would be you remove the tumor as much as you can rather than removing completely and then the rest you destroy either using another technique for example radiation radiation is another way of treating cancer you come up with very high uh, energy x ray okay or, or um, uh, gamma ray and the third option is chemotherapy this is the only one which is you can think of taking um, similar to taking paracetamol when you have fever okay so this is the treatment which uses medicine okay among these three now this is one of the very widely used why because even if you do surgery you can never make sure that all the tumor tissues are removed because as i told you they looks very similar okay and uh, so unless you remove everything there is a chance that it will regrow so even after surgery you need to give chemotherapy okay or radiotherapy is also given especially for breast cancer patients but not everybody can have radiotherapy because of some other um, uh, conditions when um, um, somebody has cancer so chemotherapy is used for localized uh, cancers as well as this is used and this is i would say the only option when you have the disease metastasized to many organs okay and that is why this is special now there are many um, you know advanced treatment modalities which are uh, in the clinical trial or made it to the clinic and one of them is i think you all heard something called immunotherapy okay so it's a, it's a very broad term immunotherapy has again different sub types okay for example this is all has to do with your own immunity and that is the best weapon okay now when you have cancer growing inside your body you have the immunity right then how can cancer grow it's an undesired thing so our body will not permit it to grow but it does so what happens is that immunity is controlled by something called t cells it's it's a part of that 
our immune system and which kills bacteria, virus, whatever undesired things we are having inside our body. What it does is it has a receptor, okay, PDL2, and this receptor the cancer cells use and bind through and make a bridge with the T cells which are present in the tumor. Because tumor does not have only tumor cells, it has T cells, it has lymphocytes, it has many other things. Okay. One of them is the T cell, you make a bridge like this, and then they send the signal, which is a hormonal signal, and that switch off the proliferation of the T cells. Because if you can think of T cells as an army, you need more and more army to win and war, right? Again. But then if you have only one guy and he cannot even move his feet, and then he cannot fight at all. He's just sitting there and doing nothing. Okay, because you need certain number of T cells to kill some cancer cells. So that is how they control the immunity. And that is why the surface of the tumor is very much immunocompromised. Our immunity cannot even go there to do anything. Now, what you can do is if you can use a drug or antibody, so the, the transporter or receptor which are in the cell surface are called antigens. For example, uh, sorry this thing okay this is called antigen so if you come up with an antibody that will bind to this antigen and will break the bridge between um, cancer cells and the t cells then the t cells can again proliferate and divide into larger numbers and then can fight back so this is what you do either using an antibody or you use a small molecule drug okay you can do this and then your immunity can fight against the cancer that you have okay and there are other ways of doing it which is also called sometimes cell therapy which is recently approved i think even available now in actrex probably uh, for some special patients and this is also similar in that case what you do is you take some of the t cells from the patient and artificially outside the body you block this transporter and then you inject back okay so basically the principle is same but you can do it in three, four ways, okay? And however, remember, this is a very nice thing, a uh, very nice technique, uh, a lo lot of less side effect, but this alone does not work. You need to apply chemotherapy together with this, okay? It's not going to uh, be able to cure um, the cancer completely using this. Now, another um, therapeutic option, which is not in the clinic, but in the advanced clinical trial, is something called photodynamic therapy. So this is a combination of a chemical and light. Okay. So this technique has its own advantage and its uh, own disadvantage. So what is the main advantage is, let me tell you first uh, how it works. So in this case, this particular chemical, you see, these are extended pi system. So pi systems means aromatic system, if you know a little bit of uh, the basic chemistry. And because of this, this molecule can absorb a lot of light. Okay, and can get excited from singlet to the triplet state. Once they reach the triplet state, the energy of the triplet state is very much close to the triplet oxygen. This is how you have to choose the molecule. Once you have your excited molecule and then oxygen is there in the triplet state, there can be an energy transfer. And then oxygen will be excited to its singlet form or you call it a reactive oxygen species. That is what is written here called ROS, reactive oxygen species. So you form these kind of, you know, a triplet, um, a singlet oxygen or oxygen radicals. And those are very highly reactive molecule with a, with a half-life of few picosecond, uh, femtosecond um, half-life, okay? So whatever they find, they will react. Now, just think about this molecule, okay? You apply to a patient and you give some sort of three, four hours. So statistically, it will be everywhere. It will go to the blood first, circulate, it will be everywhere, and a fraction of this molecule will end up in the tumor, right? Normal, let's say 5%. And the rest will be either excreted or will be in the other organ. But as I told you, this molecule is not toxic. So even if it's accumulating somewhere else, eventually with time, it will be cleared from the body. Then those 5% that is accumulated in the tumor after two hours, you come with the light and you irradiate the tumor that time you are producing this reactive oxygen species locally inside the tumor and that will oxidize the the tumor tumor the, 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 the tumor tissue and completely destroy it so the good part here is that you don't have to care about toxicity of other part of the body 
because the molecule itself is not toxic. You will make it toxic when you come up with light. This is the advantage. So you can, um, you know, kind of think of it's a safe technique. But the problem is, you can think of this is just an alternative to surgery because you very much know where the tumor is. And so that means it has to be in the initial stage. And only this technique you use where you have the tumor on the surface somewhere, you can reach with the light because everywhere you cannot go with the light inside to the organ, right? So this one has its own advantages, disadvantages. All right. So now let's uh, talk more about uh, the, the widely apply, uh, applied techniques, which is chemotherapy. So as I told you, this is a technique which um, uses drugs, drug molecules, okay, or chemicals. And these, these molecules, if you look at, um, as a chemist, you categorize them as a small molecule. Because if you think of a protein, okay, or DNA or RNA, for example, those will be called macromolecules, and these are small molecules, okay. So here, I put a few structure, you buy them like these bottles, okay. Like it's written taxol here. This is written doxorubicin. It's written cisplatin, carboplatin, oxaliplatin. But if you look at from a chemist uh, point of view, the structure looks like this. This is taxol, doxorubicin. These are two organic molecules. Obviously, structurally complicated. Lot of chiral centers. Okay, uh, if you know what chirality is, and then you have these four compounds which are special because they contain metal. Okay, these contains only carbon, nitrogen, uh, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, and hydrogen. That's why they are called organic. Okay, but this one contains nitrogen, hydrogen, chlorine, all are organic thing. But on top of that, you have one platinum, which is an inorganic element. Okay, and so these molecules are typically given intravenously with saline um, for half an hour or even longer depending on how fast the student can, uh, the, uh, the patient can take it. And uh, among these molecules, I would say these last three are special because these three molecules has a very broad spectrum of anti-cancer activity because if you look at specifically cisplatin and carboplatin, these are used to treat wide variety of cancers, okay? and Specifically for testicular cancer, I would like to mention since the discovery of cisplatin and carboplatin, now testicular cancer can be cured more than 90% cases. So that is what I mentioned in the beginning that it's not like every cancer you get the cancer, you, you die. It's not a true statement anymore. Okay. So it depends in which stage of the disease is organized, who is, and you will even understand more when I will talk about the risk and benefit factor. It really depends on the proper diagnosis, the proper prescri prescription, the proper therapy uh, suggestions from the doctor, and there are a lot of uh, other things, okay? Um, at least testicular cancer is not that much of a threat anymore um, to us, okay? And thanks to uh, the, this, this beautiful inorganic compound. I would like to just show you quickly, okay? We have this thing, since we work uh, with these molecules, how actually they look like? Okay, <clears throat> you can see this. Okay, so this is the cisplatin. This is how the the chemical form is. You can check it, and this is the next one, the carboplatin. Okay, so this is a yellow powder, and this is uh, just a white powder, which a modified version of of uh, of cisplatin. Um, so if you look at what was done, basically was the two chloride ligands here of this metal compound was replaced with a malonate ligand just to improve the plasma stability. Other than that, the active function of this uh, active functionality of this molecule is platinum and the two amine, okay? And that is why both the compound has a similar spectrum of anti-cancer activity. And this molecule is somewhat little bit special and which has a very narrow anti-cancer activity and is specifically used for colorectal cancer together with 5 chlorouracil okay? So these are the drugs typically people um, use quite often. Now, let's have a look how these molecules work, okay? And for that to, to, to tell you, it's very important to understand a little bit uh, the general concept of something called pharmacokinetics. 
don't don't worry about this complicated term but what does it mean is when you take a medicine let's say paracetamol just think about simple things you don't have to think of anti cancer drugs or complicated stuff you take paracetamol what your body does to paracetamol that is called pharmacokinetics okay so what your body does is that you take the paracetamol let's assume that you take it as a pill and then in gut it will be absorbed to the blood flow right if you take it intravenously something it will directly in your blood okay so now here is this 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 red box represents your blood circulation so the drug is now circulating in the blood and where it's going during this it's going to the liver going to the lung okay kidney and so on so in the kidney from your blood things are getting filtered out okay and a fraction of the drug will bind to protein in the blood you have lot of serum albumin okay 80% of your blood is actually serum albumin and lot of enzymes in the blood which can do also biotransformation chemical reaction and can generate metabolites which will be then throw out to the kidney and a fraction of the drug will penetrate the tissue and will reach some of the organs and among these one of the organ will be your target tissue where the cancer is sitting okay so this is what happens and all of them are happening simultaneously it's not like one after another okay so that means you see for developing a drug how challenging it is you have to control the excretion it should not circulate longer you have to control it should not react with the protein in the blood it should not be metabolized with the enzyme okay so it's a very very challenging task of getting a balance of all these things and then it has to reach the reach the tissue ultimately where you want the drug to work which is here okay so this is called pharmacokinetics now another term you have to understand very you know um, in a very um, uh, crude way at least is that something called pharmacodynamics which is what the drug does to your body so before we have learned that what our body does to a medicine when we take it now the second thing is what the medicine does to your body then you will be able to understand how medicine works okay so let's start from a molecular level so if you think of a molecular level what i mean by this is they think about a cell okay what are the the molecules that we require for function is nucleic acids which are dna rna for example proteins okay some lipids enzymes receptors and this is how a cell is built okay so if you want to look at the molecular world these will be the one that you want to modulate using a chemical or your chemical is a medicine okay now if you can modulate the function of any of these that will affect the function of the whole cell in a cellular level because inside the cells you have this these are the you know um, active uh, molecules inside the cell now if your cell function is interrupted that will interrupt the function of an organ or specifically where this cell is sitting let's say this one here if this happens then inside this particular organ you will have a chance to interfere with the cells which is ultimately tumor okay so this is how a drug works now let's look at here okay in the molecular level let's say you inject the compound and after circulation a fraction 5 to 10% reaches the tumor and then what will happen it will enter the cells okay what made the tumor so just imagine this is the blood flow okay and i took an example of here a platinum drug this platinum so let me just explain to you quickly um, as a chemist what this structure means okay this is a flat compound what we call is a square planar compound and what you have you have a platinum and that is holding four ligands four ligands mean two amine this blue color coded okay those two we call them non living group why non living group is because when the platinum binds to its target these are the group which are still sticking there you will see in a minute okay and these two chlorides we call them living group because on the way they are getting dust from the metal center okay so what happens is you inject this molecule this is circulating with the chemotherapy okay given let's say through half an hour with the saline and this is the blood and in the blood you have a very high concentration of chloride which is hundreds of millimolar okay 
and that is that helps to have this molecule intact the chloride stay intact with the metal center then when it reaches the cell surface it can enter the cell either passively okay or it can take help of some transporter which is called copper transporter or organic cation transporter the extensive research was done on this and this is how people find out the molecule goes inside the cell so this is the inside the cell picture once this is inside the cell if you look at the chloride concentration it's kind of tenfold lower now so what will happen is if you think of if you remember a little bit of a little bit of chemistry what will happen is inside the cell you have plenty of water right it's a lot of water inside and this metal chloride bonds are very labile okay so when you have less chloride concentration more water what will happen is your one or both the chlorides will be lost and you come up with an intermediate which looks like this so here you have platinum and the water molecule bind to it the chloride is out that is what i called is a labile ligand because you will lose them on the way okay and this everything is happening in the cytoplasm okay and this is where the nucleus is where we have all the genomic dna and everything packed okay then this molecule goes to dna and then bind to dna covalently just remember this term what i call this covalently what does it mean is that if you look at platinum and chloride this is a covalent bond okay so there is a direct electron orbital overlap okay now what happens is that if you look at even closely the dna platinum bound adduct looks like this okay so here is the platinum and this is the amine this is another amine and this platinum bind to the dna bases which is here and here or here you can see it even even better okay this is the amine amine this is platinum the two chlorides are out and this is bound to another nitrogen in a base pair of the dna and this is another base and platinum specifically preferred to go to the guanine base we have four bases you know adenine guanine cytosine and thymine right this is how the dna is made so it prefers to go to n7 positions of guanine and that is experimentally already known and so you form this kind of cross links with the dna now what i told you from uh, from the beginning is that the inherent property of cancer is to divide from one cell to two cells that's the ultimate thing how we cell divide for the cells to divide it's very important to copy everything into twice so let's say if you have the dna n number it has to be two n number protein n number it has to be two n number then only you can have two pieces from one right now how the process starts the process starts with first duplicating the dna if you have n number of dna you will have two n number of dna now how this works is this n number of dna are not a single strand dna okay they are double strand like this okay so for duplicating the dna first first thing is they have to separate to single strand and then each strand will have their complementary strand built then you have two pieces of the same dna okay and who does that is the the strand breaking is done by something called helices okay and then you have rna polymerase which slides through one strand and form another strand now just imagine this is one dna strand and this is platinum sitting here right and then how does the dna polymerase will come and go through it cannot pass through it just stops here so it comes and stops here okay so this is what exactly happens and the transcription is blocked okay so once the syn dna synthesis and transcription which is the rna synthesis is blocked what happens is what happens is that the cells induce a a self death mechanism which is called apoptosis okay and this is how the cells die because of dna targeted platinum drugs okay now another drug what we talk about is doxorubicin which is another very widely used um, chemotherapeutic drug which is a organic drug but quite often used for specifically ovarian cancer okay and this also targets dna but if you look at the mechanism is little bit different okay so what happens is as i told you dna is coiled right this is normal dna the fast process is sorry the fast process is topoisomerase 2 and helices will split these two strands to a single strand and then the duplication starts when doxorubicin binds here with the double strand 
it stabilizes the double strand it doesn't allow it to separate with the top isomer okay so ultimately you are blocking the duplication of dna but in a little bit different way okay and how it does it it binds with the dna again there is a difference i want to uh, you know mention it here that platinum binds with dna in a covalent manner we have seen that on the on the to the bases but here what it does is it sits in between two base pairs so it's not a covalent interaction it's a non covalent interaction okay but ultimately it's binding to the dna and most of the chemotherapeutic drugs just for information are dna targeted drugs and that is one of the problem because now we are trying to develop something um where you not necessarily need to have dna as a target okay and other targets are better why i will tell you uh, when i will talk about the resistance when you have a several cycles in some patients the same medication doesn't work anymore and that is called resistance all right so now we have learned at least how this molecule works okay now let's look at um some of the benefits of chemotherapy what it can do um so there are different type of responses one is obviously complete response that is what we love to have okay and that happens in some cases specifically if you take an example of testicular cancer uh, treated with cisplatin okay you will often end up having complete response then partial response where you have 30 to 40% of shrinkage of the tumor okay and uh, in some cases you have stable disease so you will not shrink the tumor but also it will not allow the tumor to grow okay and in those cases the patient can at least survive a little bit longer okay and what it does it does that when you reduce the size of the tumor or you does not allow the tumor to grow the metastasis risk is also reduced and which is one of the important you know criteria for cancer to progress to the next stage metastasis means from one organ to another organ traveling okay and um, obviously the minor um another minor uh, benefit is relief from the pain and and inflammation and so on so these are the things that we get now everything comes at a cost okay and what are the bad thing about about chemotherapy and that is why i call it a, a, you know um, a, a double sided sword is that often you see lot of nasty side effects okay and some of them are uh, very important to 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 know because for example nephrotoxicity okay is one of the very well known um side effect that is observed for patient who undergoes uh, therapy with platinum drugs like testicular cancer patients okay and uh, but nowadays i will show you a little bit in 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 a minute or so uh, there are strategies that you can apply and you can you know get rid of this nephrotoxicity problem uh, when you are treating with the platinum drug and that was possible because of the technological advances and more research and and, and development hmm? kidney yeah so this this actually what it, it does is we will learn the mechanism even a little bit because otherwise i will not be able to explain to you uh, what are the tricks are being used to to make it better okay so nephrotoxicity one and cardiotoxicity which is even more dangerous because this happens for patient who are taking doxorubicin okay what it does is that it goes to your heart the part of the drug when it's given uh, to the to the circulation and for our heart to to reg regulate this cardiac cells they they need to have a very tight regulation of calcium okay so it releases calcium because of the stress and once it releases it kind of freezes it doesn't beat anymore okay and lot of people even used to die it was lot long back not like uh, let's say 25 30 years back okay but now there are obviously you know not uh, um there that uh, technology is there you can monitor everything so these are the good things and now neurotoxicity can happen also people undergo you know chemotherapy can like shake the rest of the year so now you see today's cancer patients can be tomorrow's some other patients like either cardio patient or kidney patient and and something so that you don't want right because you want to have a quality life for for the for the people who survived cancer i think he deserves the most i mean he wins against of the very very nasty thing but uh, we give him another disease okay and uh, then you know this is not a nice feeling obviously you know they are vomiting those things are there then another very serious problem uh, with with chemotherapy is that in case there is not a very nice measurement of the dose what can happen is you are not killing the cancers but you are 
making them wounded. So you can imagine what will happen if you just leave a tiger and a wounded tiger. Okay, so he will try to bite you back. Okay, and that is what happens with the cancer. If you give the cells stress, but don't kill them, it's a biological mechanism. Everybody wants to survive. It's a cancer scale, bacteria, we, everybody wants to survive, right? So we come up with everything what we have. So what they will do is they will develop some sort of defense mechanism and uh, develop some resistance. Then in the next cycle, they will not care about the dose at all, okay? In that case, what happens is that when you are using one drug and if they develop resistance, that means most of the drugs are targeting DNA and working through the same mechanism. So if they develop resistance against one of the DNA targeted drug through, let's say, repairing the DNA, then all of them will fail because all of them works through DNA. Okay. And then the risk is that when you have the those cells migrated to another organ and give you the secondary tumor, those are resistant to everything. Okay, so that means you have nothing at that point of time. So that is actually very bad. Um, okay, so now we learn a little bit about the chemistry of this side effect or the biology. Okay, how it happens. So this is a very, very, um, you know, um, cartoon uh, way of presenting it, but it's much more complex. Okay, um, so the first thing what I told you is that the side effect okay and why this happens is because if you look at the small molecules you can imagine they don't have any property which will tell them okay oh you are in the blood now go to the tumor and sit there it's not like that they will just randomly be everywhere right and if that is happening because of the lack of selectivity what you have is you inject your, your comp compound in the or, or the drug in the in the, the systemic circulation it's going everywhere a fraction will go to the tumor but other let's say small molecule drugs typically were excreted through urine okay so they are filtered to the kidney and during that just look at cisplatin what i told you is this metal chloride bond is labile right when we are talking about its mechanism how it kills cancer so once this metal chloride bond is labile and it finds a biomolecule which has a nucleophile like nitrogen center or sulfur center it will try to stick there okay so that means our kidney has nephrons and those has also DNA. And it will not only bind to cancer cell DNA because it doesn't have any such switch or property that will drive its binding to cancer cell DNA. It will also bind to your nephrons and will stick there for years. And then slowly it will give you inflammation. And maybe in eight years, 10 years later, you will have kidney failure or serious problem uh, of, of renal dysfunction. Okay. So that is what happens. Now for doxorubicin, the problem is the main cardiotoxicity. The, and that I already told you, it actually disbalances the, the calcium um, homeostasis in the, in the heart cells, okay? And same mechanism happens if something goes to a central nervous system, okay? Or to the air. And these all four are related to platinum drugs. And this is with the doxorubicin, okay? Now, another thing we need to understand quickly is that what are the mechanism of resistance? What I told you is a very bad thing about a uh, patient undergoing chemotherapy and then if they don't respond, okay? So that means it's, it's a very, very bad sign. So what happens is that there are many different type of mechanism, okay? Against which the cells develop a mechanism to defense the effect of the drug. And so first thing is, as I mentioned once again, all these chemotherapy drugs are targeted to DNA, okay? So now that means you are damaging the DNA, right? And this is how you block. And if you damage the DNA, now if there is something available to the cells which can repair the damage very efficiently, so that means it will, it, 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 it will not necessarily respond to your damage, okay? And that is what happens. They use something called DNA repair machinery, which we have this machinery everywhere, okay? And this is where... Um, in the cancer cells, they can sometimes very much upregulate these proteins and can cut the piece of the DNA what you damaged and throw it out and repair the DNA there. Okay, so that means you don't see the effect. Now, when the cells die because you cause a DNA damage, there are some processes also happens in between. For example, you damage the DNA, then there it needs a few kinases for ATR, P53, those are the scientific terms. And then ultimately, you end up with caspase, 
okay which is kind of a, you can think of a seizure which got everything whatever it find okay caspase is not there when a cell is healthy and normal but when you block the 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 division of the cells by damaging the dna using this path ultimately it ends up producing lot of caspase because you want it want to die it doesn't want to suffer okay and uh, so what it can do is you cause the dna damage it can down regulate this protein so that means it will sit there and take time to repair the dna rather than die okay that is another mechanism the third mechanism is there are thiol containing proteins or peptides and one of them is glutathione which is i wrote it as gsh and it's a tripeptide it has a sulfur atom and sulfur atoms loves to bind to platinum okay because sulfur atoms are soft platinum 2 is also a soft center so it's a perfect you know combination and then your platinum comes inside the cell and then if the glutathione binds to it it cannot bind to dna anymore it's deactivated so then what they do is they can produce millimoles of glutathione inside the cell okay that is another mechanism and the fourth mechanism is throwing things out from the cell oh platinum is coming throw it out okay so these are the common mechanism that operates when you see resistance against chemotherapeutic drug okay and now how what are the things people normally do or doctors do because you need so the potency is there okay it, it has been successful for many years the main problem is to balance the risk and the benefit okay how it starts so one thing the first thing you have to think of a dose okay because dose is very very important thing everything is toxic after certain dose even if you drink too much of water okay it is going to be toxic okay so dose is very important when it comes to toxicity or efficacy of a particular medicine okay you need to find a sweet spot where you have appreciable efficacy okay but not too much side effect and the second thing is very important to assess the condition of the patient before prescribing a particular medicine okay why i say so is just imagine if somebody has little bit of problem with the heart okay and you give doxorubicin so just imagine what kind of complications you are going there okay and this should not be the case okay so that means um the doctor has lot to do here okay to be honest i mean they are the best that who can decide on this case and uh, then proper planning okay of the treatment it's not like okay this cancer uh, he has problem with the um, with the heart so give him platinum okay it's it's not like that even if you are giving a particular medicine you need to plan properly know the thing know the thing means what kind of problem it can create to the patient for platinum kidney toxicity is very well known so now for several years of research ultimately led to a very nice and easy solution what is the easy solution is nothing sophisticated you hydrate the patient a lot starting from two days before you give the give the medicine so it's completely hydrated and you are giving it in saline so it's hydrated anyway afterwards for next five days or so give him lot of fluid okay and how it works and how it you know help to reduce the kidney toxicity because just imagine here platinum is bound to the kidney to a nitrogen a molecule or a sulfur molecule now um, you all i think learn at some point that every reaction is reversible something called microscopic reversibility right so now although the platinum nitrogen or platinum sulfur bond is thermodynamically much more stable but if you have millions of water molecule a few molecule will tend to form a water complex with platinum so that means it will come out and then the moment it is detached from the kidney it will be excreted because really on the filter right and that is how you control it's a very nice and very easy technique okay but it should not be neglected it's very important and then for cardio toxicity problem of um, of, uh, of 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 doxorubicin um there has been many efforts to derivatize the molecule to make it you know better but so far there was no success everything whatever you do the inherent nature of the uh, 
stockage of the molecule has to you know do with something and that is why the molecule goes and end up a lot in the in the in the heart um so how this is nowadays uh, you know um monitored in the clinic is either using um some marker biomarker so um which is a little bit sophisticated um test of a heart rather than just the beating or other other normal test in the clinic you look at the marker and then you find out how healthy the heart is and if those markers are getting affected if you treat with doxorubicin first you find out that and then only you go for doxorubicin which is a little bit complicated but continuous monitoring uh, during treatment and after treatment uh, help many people actually okay and now what are coming in the in the next years or you know next 5 years or so um obviously the best option is that chemotherapy has been successful is successful there and is going to be okay no matter if you have immunotherapy or whatever it is okay you need this so that means the best way is to come with a drug which is little bit more safer than what we have now okay and uh, then another problem is they told you why you see lot of side effect is because it goes everywhere so if we can tackle um and make the molecule in such a way using our our, our chemistry knowledge that will give them a property that will selectively drive to the cancer part cancer organ or cancer tissue and will be excreted from the body the rest of the thing and uh, then another very important thing which is also coming in a few years i think is something called personalized therapy because not every medicine works similarly to everyone okay like even if you take paracetamol uh, i need a different dose he need a different dose and you need a different dose to see the same effect okay so this why is this because we are individual okay and the way our body functions the way our organ functions are very different and how do we know um that uh, this is very different is because nowadays it's possible to have a whole genome sequence very quickly for a patient okay and if you know that you know what are the difficulties or what are the problem with that particular genome and you have a database okay of what medication is given to those particular category of patients and what are the responses what are the drawbacks okay what are the efficacy so matching those you will be able to come up with a solution okay this is the patient this is the genome this medicine is probably the one which is the best one because you have plenty available nowadays okay for a particular disease to treat all right so these are um, the general things now yeah i think we can take a tie break yeah one hour let's let's do this i think i will need 5 5 six minutes more and then let's finish and then we can discuss maybe more yeah yeah so um look in in my lab what we are trying to do is obviously one of the you know um urgent need is, is to come up with a drug that is much more safe okay and much more even efficacious and it can be used for treatment of resistant cancers because when you have resistance there is nothing okay so um we are working on many different ideas okay i'm not going to all the details so these are the subheadings of the project this is the kind of umbrella under this we work now i will just talk to you briefly about one direction that we are working on and this has to deal with the kidney toxicity problem of a platinum drug okay and i will show you it's possible it's not like impossible okay um so first let's quickly understand as a chemist what you need in this molecule why this molecule work or be able to kill because this molecule has metal chloride bonds yes um if i may request you maybe um this because from this slides onward if you could probably not take pictures or something so with the, data is data. I, these are, these are all unpublished data so i'm so sorry but uh, we can talk everything i can show you more okay um yeah so so now what we are trying to do is here that first you need to understand to come up with a hypothesis how this molecule functions okay so you have the platinum chloride bonds and those are detached from the metal center and then this binds to the dna we learned right so that means this metal chloride bond liability is very important this is how you see the activity this is how it can kill cancer okay 
But on the way, what happens, I also talked to you that if you have a sulfur containing biomolecule, for example, glutathione, that sticks to platinum before even it reaches the nucleus. So you are losing the efficacy. So the reactivity is also bad at the same time. Okay. And then the kidney toxicity and neurotoxicity problem is also coming from the reactivity because it stays there for five years, ten years. Sticks to there. Okay. Now, what we thought of is what if we come up with a molecule and we retain the activity and it doesn't have any reactive groups? It doesn't leave anything, okay, during its function. So we screened many molecules as a chemist and what we found was this molecule, okay. Um, we call it as a PD33 and we have done extensive cell study and everything. And then one of the molecules that we call a heat, this PD33 molecule, what we see here is, I'm not showing the, the cell results here, directly the mice results, we have generated lung cancer in this mice, okay? And when we have the tumor here, we started the treatment and the treatment was given one milligram per kg intraperitoneally in day 1, 4, 8, 11, 15, 18 and 21, okay? And we used also cisplatin just to compare, okay, which is a clinically used drug. So now you look what happens. We measure the tumor in different days. And this is the one or two, which is called vehicle control that does not, the mice of the, the group of the mice that does not receive any treatment. Okay. Those are the two. So the tumor is growing. And then when you treat the group of the mice with this PD33, which is the red line here, you can see it doesn't allow the tumor to grow as much. Okay. And Cisplatin also doesn't allow the tumor to grow as much, but both are comparable. The growth inhibition of the tumor is comparable. So you see, by making this molecule completely inert, we did not lose the efficacy. The efficacy is equally good what you buy in the clinic. Okay. And then if this molecule, you put it in a liposome, okay, for better delivery. And uh, we can discuss maybe during the, during the, uh, after the chai, uh, that how liposome formulation helps you to deliver something to the cancer. Okay. That's a separate thing. And we can see even a little bit better inhibition of the tumor growth. Okay. So now it's kind of very sure, we are very sure that the compound is now equipotent. Okay. And it's very good. The animals are not dead, but in the cisplatin treated group, out of six animals, two are dead. Okay. Even with this dose. So you can see there are toxicities which are going on. We, you cannot see from outside. Then obviously we point, the, the main thing we ought to investigate is if the mice were dead because of uh, you know, nephrotoxicity, obviously the renal failure. And how you check this is you look at the inflammatory markers in the kidney. So the mice which were undergoing treatment, we took out the kidney and then we measured some marker. So what happens is the marker, higher the marker, more the damage in the kidney, okay? So here you have untreated control group mice, six mice. This is the marker. This is the marker when you treat with this compound. And this is the marker when you treat the mice with cisplatin. So you can see the marker goes high up to kind of five-fold, okay? And this is another marker. This is NOx4 and this is, uh, this is TNF alpha, this is NOx4. So both the inflammatory marker, which are the signature of kidney damage, are off. When you treat a patient with or a mice with cisplatin. But you see, because we make this molecule inert, it doesn't induce kidney toxicity at all. And why this is normal? When you look at the biodistribution, you just look, I want you to look at here, okay? Look at the kidney accumulation of our compound and look at the kidney accumulation of cisplatin, okay? So it's almost tenfold higher, okay? Because it does not stick there. It doesn't bind covalently to any biomolecule, okay? So you see a very simple idea. It's possible to design molecules which are equally active and you can get rid of one of the very bad side effects of, of platinum drugs, okay? And uh, I will probably stop here, okay? And uh, I would like to quickly acknowledge um, all the wonderful people uh, who are working with me. Um, and one of them is here, um, Sreyas. And, uh, so he is a hardcore organic synthetic chemist and uh, he's learning now biology. And um, 
I also would like to thank quickly all the collaborators uh, who had helped us with uh, with MICE and MICE studies, for example. And the funding, of course, uh, without uh, funding, you cannot do. The research is very expensive nowadays, TIFR and uh, HCRB in India. And uh, specifically, I would like to quickly thank uh, one of this, this giant who was my mentor in MIT. And uh, so after cisplatin was discovered, nobody knew what was the target and uh, whether it binds to DNA, where it binds to DNA. And this is the guy, his name is Stephen Jellipard. I worked with him as a postdoc and it was really a really wonderful time. And this is the guy who actually, you know, make me motivated uh, to work on you know, uh, anti-cancer drugs. And uh, so he was the one who discovered where cisplatin goes, how it goes inside the cell, where it binds and how the DNA structure is changed. And so, so he's the, he's the pioneer in this, in this field. So I would like to quickly thank him. And, uh, I would like to also thank all of you, uh, for listening to me. I think I took a little bit of more time and sorry about it. And uh, so we can have now think tea and then. So what we'll do is, uh, we would take online questions uh, yeah. first, and then we'll stop the live stream. Yeah. The online audience, unfortunately does not get chat. So we will see, are there any questions on Zoom and YouTube that we need to take? Yeah. There's a question on Zoom. There's a question on Zoom, go ahead. So the question is, how does heterobicin compare to doxorubicin in terms of cardiotoxicity and epirubicin? Which, which rubicin? Epirubicin. Epirubicin, yeah. yeah. So epirubicin is not really uh, a very regularly used drug molecule. Okay, that's the first thing. And uh, second thing is, I have no idea about epirubicin's uh, pharmacology, to be honest. Yeah, it's, it's a very nice, uh, an, an, a nice, nice question, but I, I don't really know a um, lot about epirubicin. How does nicotine? How does nicotine induce cancer? I mean, smoking causes cancer. Yes, I mean, look, uh, the thing is, um, cancer is caused by mutation. So, any kind of stress. Can cause mutation, right? And nicotine is one of them. Smoking is one of them. You are stressing your lungs out. So that is what it is. But the exact mechanism is not really very well known. Okay. It's just a stress that you are giving, uh, which your body doesn't like. Uh, that's all. Anything else? Uh, is it possible to predict toxicity for an individual for a given chemotherapy drug? Yeah. That is where. Uh, the personalized therapy is coming into the picture slowly. Uh, so what you do basically is that, uh, let's say, if you know what are the potential, you know, toxic side effects of a particular drug, and what you could do is you first look at the um, how healthy those organs are. If a if a patient already has complications, let's say with heart, then you have to you know think twice before going for doxorubicin, for example. So it's it's possible to to know, and. Um, Anything else? Yes. One last question. We take all audience questions in a bit. We'll just finish the live stream and then we'll come back. I'm sure there are lots. If the drugs can kill the cancer cells, why is it not possible to reduce the side effects of chemotherapy? Perhaps you answered much of it. I think you answered much of it. Much of it, but yes. Uh, yes, yes, yes. No, no, that's okay. Um, yeah. So I think the the main main problem is that. Um, it can kill cancer cells that we want, but also it goes everywhere, right? And uh, although we don't want that, but it just happens. And uh, you kill uh, some cells uh, non-specifically in some healthy organs, and that leads to the toxicity. And uh, yeah, and uh, there are strategies to control this. Um, and I discussed, for example, you know, in the case of platinum drug, a lot of fluid given to the patient uh, for um, for doxorubicin treatment, uh, you know, together with a cardioprotective agent. Uh, helps. Yeah. So in the mice study, you give the mice also lots of fluid. No, this molecule doesn't do. In, in, so you don't have to drink lots. I mean, how do you get the mice to drink lots of water? You no, no, no. Hmm? No, no. Your, it, it, your comparison is with this platin. Yeah. But the mice are not drinking water. Or the mice are also drinking lots of. Water. No, we 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 did not. Uh, we look. I mean, several factors you cannot really include in the same experiment. So now again, we have to see. If you give a lot of fluids, it's possible to give the fluid to the mice. The only problem is you have to, you know, make them sit in one place. And then you do the sitting normally what you do. And um, which is a very, very difficult setup, <laughs> you can imagine. 
but uh, it's possible. And now we have to see uh, what is the effect of hydration and dehydration. Okay, that's it. All right, online audience, thank you very much for joining in. Uh, please, you can also send your questions later on to outreach, O-U-T-R-E-A-C-H, at tifr.res.in. And unfortunately, no chai for you. Uh, In-person audience, please join us for a cup of tea, and then we'll come back and have some more questions. I'm sure you have a lot of questions for him. Uh, let's stop. You can stop the uh, YouTube and the Zoom.